morning. Um, good morning or good afternoon, everybody. This is Bobby Childers with HarringtonLakeKY.com. I'm so honored and privileged to um, be hosting this uh, really great session with local historian and author Jack Godby. Uh, he's going to be talking to us today about Darnell, which was the uh, a state hospital for the insane. At least that was how it started. Uh, right here on the shores of Harrington Lake. And you know what? I am just going to put myself on mute and turn it over to Mr. Godby. And uh, if you'd like to introduce yourself and kick, you know, get us going. Sure. My name is Jack Godby. I am the author of the book, uh, Darnell, the story of a Kentucky mental asylum. I'm absolutely amazed at the level of interest in this hospital. People from all over the country and certain countries of the world have bought this book, are interested in this book, and the hospital had a huge, huge impact uh, on the local community. And so I will start off here talking about, I guess, a little bit of the history, uh, the land that the hospital sits on. Uh, it says, uh, I've been able to track the land back to 1781, which was uh, granted to Adam Fisher. There's 400 acres right there on the, the banks of Lake Harrington. Uh, Mr. Fisher got this land for his purpose for his service in uh, the Revolutionary War. Uh, when he got out, of course, that granted him that, that land and that became his homestead for many years. Uh, when he uh, passed away, he granted this land over to his two sons, Adam and Jeremiah. Uh, Adam Jr. then lived on the land for a few more years. Uh, what's interesting to note is, is that uh, there's a, even when this land was sold, uh, Adam Jr. sold this land uh, to a man named Charles Talbot. Uh, which is who owned it right before uh, the state got a hold of it. But there is a, the Fisher family graveyard is a seven foot section right there on that land. And that graveyard exists today and is now on the property of North Point Training Center Prison. Um, that land is uh, took care of by the inmates. It's mowed and uh, landscaped, took care of. And when it was sold, that little piece of land was not part of the purchase uh, when Fisher sold it. Uh, said it remained in the property of the Fishers until the state uh, purchased it. Uh, talking about the early beginnings of, of this land, or the, of the hospital rather, uh, really the need for the hospital was crucial. At the time, Kentucky had a few mental hospitals already. Um, the uh, Eastern State, uh, Central State, Western, and these mental hospitals were absolutely overcrowded to the point where people were sleeping on the floor, people didn't have rooms that, that, that be housed in the patients. So building a new mental hospital was essential. So Governor Happy Chandler uh, was the governor who started all this. And if you have any knowledge of the uh, history of Governor Chandler, you'll know he's not a man that sits back and assigns things to other people. He is a hands-on or was a hands-on type of governor. So he took this project on himself as far as searching for uh, this land. Jack, uh, so he, um, excuse me for interrupting. Yeah. Is that, are we talking about like, was this the late 20s or still like early 1930s? Just uh, this, is, <laughs> this is like the mid, mid 1930s, 1937 is when I, when I, was, I was started. Got that. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, Governor Happy Chandler uh, personally searched the state for a good, a good site. Uh, the site there, uh, on Bergen Road there in, in Danville uh, was pointed out as a great site because it was right there on the banks of the Lake Harrington River. It was a few miles from downtown Danville. It's easy to get you know supplies in and out. So Governor Chandler set his mind on getting this land and he did. Uh, they purchased 723 acres of land in the, on the Mercer County side uh, from the Mason brothers who had owned this land. Uh, on, that, on the Boyle County side, because this land sits right on the, the, the county line uh, in the 521 acres on the Boyle County side from Fanny Hughley. So that's a lot of, lot of acres of land. Uh, and this is what they purchased initially for the build. And so uh, since prior to, to construction of the hospital, uh, they brought in 50 inmates from the Kentucky State Reformatory in the Grange uh, by Louisville uh, to do the actual labor. Uh, they had uh, state uh, engineers, engineers on site, you know, to read the blueprints and those oversee things. But the inmates were the one that actually built uh, the hospital from from the ground up. 
uh, the interesting thing to note is, is that these inmates slept on the ground during construction. That's when, when they started everything off. They didn't have any, anywhere to, to be or to sleep or to stay. These, these inmates slept on the ground. Uh, they started everything from uh, the ground up. They had to clear, clear the land. Uh, you can see the in the pictures there where the, the basement of the uh, hospital is being built. Uh, building the, found, the foundation. Uh, it says it took over 50 inmates over three years to complete. Uh, the cost over $1 million, which at the time was an enormous amount of money. Uh, so uh, in the in the picture, it shows the hospital. You can see it's like four stories. Uh, over the years, they did build on. It is now, today, it stands at seven stories. Uh, but you can see the windows were not even uh, installed in, in this picture. Uh, it's still very much a work in progress. And at the, at the time, it's interesting to note that Governor Chandler didn't do anything halfway. So when he had this, this built, he was also building uh, a brand new prison in the Grange, the Kentucky State Reformatory. So they're building both of these at the same time. So that's a lot of money that the state's putting out all at one time on the new prison and a new mental hospital. But yeah, with that, Jack, I, you know, I'd want to mention too, like just um, as kind of a, <clears throat> as a reference point, I know that they spent $7 million on the development of the Dix Dam here on Harrington Lake in 1923-ish. So okay. we're talking maybe just what, a little over a decade and a half later. And mm -hmm. at the time that 7 million was more money that was more than the actual uh, debt of Kentucky at the time. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to throw that in there just for some perspective that, Absolutely. you know, a million dollars is still, I mean, most, yeah. I mean, obviously it's big money now, but even back then at that point, the substantial investment. Right, right. So I guess uh, the, what's interesting to note is is that Governor Chandler was in charge of building both of these these facilities, state facilities, and he didn't do anything halfway. So when he they built the hospital, uh, he told them he wanted the hospital to be a state of the art, uh, like showpiece, like nothing you'd ever seen before. And he really accomplished that. Uh, we'll see some pictures later, later on, um, show you what I'm talking about. But when you walk in the front doors. Uh, the floors are solid marble. You don't find uh, facilities, much less state facilities anymore. That's going to pay to have a marble floor. Uh, the big columns in the in the lobby are made from solid ivory. Uh, it's a really no expense was spared for this hospital. And he did the same thing for the prison, by the way. At, when he was building the KSR prison, he did it the same way. Everything was state of the art for the time period and cutting edge. All right, so uh, when the hospital started building, we're talking about 1937 here is when Happy Chandler had the hospital built. Uh, so it says by 1940, uh, the hospital was finally complete after three years of long, hard labor. The ironic part is, is after all this big to-do was made about the hospital being built and being state-of-the-art and being one of the primary uh, mental hospitals in the country, uh, the state found that they could not afford to actually open it. Wow. So they, built, they built it and it set empty. Uh, so there was no money left in the budget because of all of this uh, expenditure that they were having. Um, so it was a nice hospital, but it was, it was empty. Uh, so this uh, picture I'm showing is one from uh, Highway 33 uh, there in on Bergen Road of the hospital from a distance, which I thought was really neat. Uh, my favorite picture is probably one of this one, but I, you can look at the vehicles parked in the parking lot, you can tell, you know, the area that it comes from, and you can see on the hospital building itself, it says State Hospital, so it doesn't even have a name yet. It's sitting, you know, it's how early on the picture, picture was taken. So now we have uh, the hospital that was sitting empty. So in 1941, uh, World War II started, uh, and the Army came calling. They needed a place to house uh, the prisoners of war. So the idea was that if they had prisoners of war uh, from Germany and Italy, that they would remove them from those countries and move them to the United States to house them, then those uh, soldiers, prisoners of war, were essentially uh, non-combative, meaning they were in a strange country, strange place, didn't know anybody. Even if they escaped, where are they going to go? What are they going to do? So they brought them to over here, and the Army uh, commandeered the a hospital building for their use for a prisoner of war camp. Now, what's interesting to note 
is that the army actually paid the state the sum of one dollar for this hospital building. So they built it for over a million and they leased it for a dollar. Sounds typical state government to me. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so the, the army came in and they began to ship these German field agents to the area. Uh, it says because of the Geneva Convention, which had been in effect years earlier, uh, they could not, they, they, these prisoners of war could not, uh, had to be treated, or had to be treated fair and humane, they could not participate in anything to do with the war effort. So they couldn't take them over there and have them uh, do anything related to the war whatsoever. But they were required to stay busy. And every POW there had a job to do. Uh, whether it's cleaning or or whatever, uh, they all none of them were allowed to stay with idle hands. Uh, so uh, as, as uh, I guess initially when the army took took it over, uh, they wasn't really planning on putting any money into this into this hospital. They were just going to use it for a short time. Uh, what they realized uh, is that the war was not going to be over quickly. It turned out to be uh, more than they had bargained for. It was going to be a long term event. So they had to do something. So it says Army needed the place for American soldiers who are now returning to the uh, United States with mental issues. They referred to it at that time as shell shock. Today, we refer to it as PTSD. So all these guys are coming back from war, needing mental treatment and nowhere to go. So they decided that they were going to house them there at the hospital. So American soldiers, and German and Italian prisoners of war sharing the same building. So it doesn't take uh, a rocket scientist to figure out that's not a good combination. Right. <laughs> uh, so so uh, the army in, invested three million more dollars and they built uh, a housing uh, for the uh, American or for the German prisoners of war and the mental patients stayed in the hospital building uh, and the new housing that went to house the POWs. And I should note that these houses that they built for the POWs are now present day what is being used as the North Point State Prison. That's where these inmates are residing. So it was built with prisoners of war in mind, and it's currently has some state state prisons. Uh, and an interesting story that I heard when I was researching this is that when these mental patients from the from the army were coming in. Uh, they would arrive at the at the train depot uh, down in uh, Junction City, uh, right below Danville, and they were always wearing uh, blue straight jackets. So they usually wasn't uh, accompanied. They were just going to put on a train at one location and go off at another. So a lot of the local townspeople would see these these guys wandering around the train station with blue uh, straight jackets on, and they would get them where they needed to be. Uh, so that's how usually how how they arrived. Wow. Uh, so the, the name name change to so when the hospital was first built, it was intended on being named the Lake Harrington Asylum for the Insane. Uh, <laughs> but, but of course, it, it never opened, so that was never never. Uh, never I feel opened. like I feel like what would be really good is to have a T-shirt that says that. I agree with you. I would like that. <laughs> but, hey, give me give me just a little time. We might make that happen just out of okay pure comic yeah, yeah. relief. <laughs> Since there, uh, during the time the Army took it over, they renamed the hospital, uh, the Darnell Hospital, which is named after General Douglas Darnell. He was a World War I hero. Uh, what's interesting is that uh, a lot of the local people refer to the hospital as the Darnell. It's actually with, with an A, Dar Darnell. But I don't know if this is because of a, the, uh, the country slang that they use or just mistaken, but everybody refers to it as Darnell. And I've heard my entire life you know, you better straighten up. They're going to send you to the darn mail. I didn't have any idea what they were talking about at that time because I was just a child. Uh, right. But the, act, the actual name was the darn, darn all hospital. Wow. All right. Uh, this then, uh, when the Army uh, let it go, obviously it went to the Kentucky State Hospital. And there for a brief while, they were talking, uh, flirting around with the with the Danville and St. Asylum. But again, that never uh, took note either. All right, so here's some uh, pictures I'm showing here is when the Army started building, uh, investing more three million dollars into the new housing. Uh, this is all again all present day North Point Training Center property that we're looking at. But at the time, you know, major construction was underway. Uh, that's a, a roadway that they're building there. Uh, the, the dormitories that the prisoners of war uh, reside in uh, were being built. 
And then when it was all said and done, you can see the hospital there and then in the background. And then the dormitory for the prisoners of war, uh, the current state inmates live in the uh, dormitory, dormitories there in the, in the front of the picture. Uh, that's an aerial view from a top from a top of the uh, hospital building overlooking uh, Bergen in the Bergen direction and uh, the new housing for the POWs. Uh, what's really interesting, interesting to me is just because these prisoners of war were there and the doesn't mean that military life stopped, even though these guys had mental issues or been treated for you know PTSD. They were still very much involved in the military. So we can see them here out, outside of the living quarters uh, lined up for their morning formation, which they had to do every morning. Uh, these guys were usually kept busy uh, and also as part of their mental treatment, they were kept busy doing things for the Army. Uh, I think at the at the uh, Danville location, they were busy with uh, repairing radios, uh, two-way walkie-talkies, that type, type of thing for, for the Army. And then that's just a picture of them out in the field doing their marching exercises before uh, their day got, day got started. So even though they're in the hospital, you know, getting treatment for mental illness, like I said, it's important to note that these guys are still very much part of military life going on here. Yeah, uh, just so a they're... random strange question, just, uh, just because they're black and white, was, what were their jumpsuits? It looks like a dark color. I'm assuming orange didn't become a favorite until later. I was just kind of curious if you knew um, like the color of uh, like their, their jumpsuits that they have to wear. Yeah, their they're, uh, they're suits that they wore were always a dark green color. Oh, okay. And then and some of the, uh, the supervisor and staff uh, nurse type situations always wore solid white top and bottom. Yeah. Very cool. I, I I bring it up because people had mentioned, I was talking to a gentleman yesterday, in fact, that he he remembers when it was, you know, still in that, still uh, part of that system. And he, he was talking, you know, being able to see them fishing and, you know, interacting right at the lake shore. So thank absolutely. you for clarifying. Absolutely. Uh, so life inside the hospital as a, as an American uh, soldier uh, was pretty much uh, similar to what it would be like later on as a mental facility. You can see a picture here of one of the American soldiers and they're playing uh, ping pong there. And what's interesting to note is like I said, the, the hospital has seven floors. Every floor is identical uh, with the exception of the lobby. Uh, the first floor, every other floor above that is identical. So it's very easy to get turned, turned around, but every floor has its own kitchen, uh, these big community rooms, and then the patient rooms. So you see the, the patient here in one of the big community rooms uh, that's playing, playing some games. Uh, when, the, when the hospital uh, was had these POWs, one thing that really came to light here is that they really wanted them to stay busy. So one of the things that they found out was that a lot of the uh, young men who normally would work on uh, a farm were now gone to war. So there was nobody left to, to, to get the corn and the tobacco and, and soybeans in. So they were really extreme labor shortage. So they put their minds together and they figured out we're going to put these German prisoners of war to work. Then they're going to lease them out to the local farmers to use. Well, a lot of these local farmers didn't want anything to do with these Germans because they already had hard feelings from World War One left over because most of those older farmers were in World War One. Uh, so they, they're like, I don't want nothing to do with these guys, you know. But really, after a while, uh, need really over overtook uh, or dislike, and they had no choice. I've got to get my crops in. I've got to make it work. Fine, send them on. So they send them on. And what they realized is, at their short time, is these guys are really not the enemy. They were really just people like anybody else, and they learned really quickly that these guys were no different than themselves. They had families. They had you know, dreams and, and things they wanted and they wanted to accomplish in their life. And they became really a, a part of the community. Uh, some of them so much so that a lot of the Germans ended up marrying American girls and staying here after the war was over, uh, living their lives, uh, opening up businesses. And if you if you ever noticed a lot of the, well, some of the local communities will have what they refer to as German towns, which is an all German population where they speak German, and the culture is German, the school, the school is German, everything. 
And that's the result of a lot of, a lot of these Germans who just refused to leave after after the war was over. Life was good. They didn't want, they didn't want to go home. Uh, but because of the, the labor shortage, they did go to work in the farm. This was mandated and instituted by the uh, Kentucky Farm Bureau. They didn't want to get the help their farms needed. And so they instituted this uh, prisoner and leasing program. And they leased them for $2 a day. So that was pretty cheap labor for the farmer to pay. Uh, and it was, it went to, some of it went to the POW, most of it went back to the state. Uh, one thing that I've always found interesting about this is a lot of these POWs, they didn't stay at the farms and they were really overcrowded at the hospital as well because Americans were taking precedence of the rooms. Uh, they built a tent city there in Danville for these uh, guys to live in. And this tent city was located on, in current day Danville there on Eastonville Road, about where uh, Aldi's grocery store, uh, the Dollar General Shopping Center in that area, that's, yeah. where, their, that's where their tent city was located at back in that, back in that field. Wow. And it, was, it was ran by the man named John Barn, Barnsdale. He was the leader of it. Uh, so they would go to work in the farms every day. They would come home, uh, home, so to speak, at, at night to these tent, tent cities. Uh, and that's where they stayed. And there were some issues there where guys, you know, the prisoners would become violent. They would try to escape, that type of thing. But John Barnes, they all ran a tight ship and he kept he kept things in line for the most part. So it says these tents they lived in were 16 by 16, put seven POWs in a tent. Uh, so pretty, pretty tight quarters there. Uh, this picture is an actual work order from that tent city. Uh, you can see the uh, the, the farmer's name at the bottom, Marcus Russell, he's the guy that signed off on it. This is, you know, he, they've done this much work. And then there's all the German names of the guys that work, that work for him and shows how long they worked and what they did and that type of thing. So when the war was over, uh, the army no longer had a need for the POWs. So they were going to give the hospital back to the state. Uh, so they made a deal with the state that you, they purchased it back from the army. Uh, for the sum of one dollar, which is what the army paid for it themselves. Um, what's interesting to note is that when the army left, they left everything as it is. They in, in the military life, they call it bugging out, which means everything stays exactly where it is, and people leave. And that's really what happened at this hospital. Uh, even years later, when it became the North Point Prison, there were still filing cabinets and. Uh, equipment and a lot of stuff in the army that was still sitting there and still there and, and, uh, and jeeps that type of thing was and north point is of course they use metal detectors a lot to go around the prison grounds to make sure the prison was not bearing anything or anything underhanded a lot of times these metal detectors will just go crazy and the, it's because there's entire jeeps and filing cabinets and supplies buried in the ground uh, that the army left when they when they left. Wow. Uh, but, but also uh, the deal that the army made was that the state can have the building back for a dollar, but they had to require, uh, I think it was 450 beds be reserved for military guys who continued to need treatment. So they wasn't just going to leave them high and dry. They wanted to continue getting treatment. So the, the hospital at this time had like 800 beds in it. So for over half of them were required to, to, to stay with uh, the army. Jack, was there any, um, so you just, I, I was about to ask, so thanks for clarifying. So it had 800 beds. Do you know, like, if it ever maxed out with the POWs as well as the uh, um, the Americans who were receiving treatment and with the additional tent city, I was just kind of curious if there had been at any point, like just a maximum peak. Yeah, well, it, it stayed it stayed maxed out for most, for most of the time. That's why this tent city was really necessary okay. to get those guys off, off of the grounds uh, and in, in, into the, into the tent, so it was really easy. They stayed full for most of the whole time. Thank you. So this uh, headline is from the, the Danville newspaper there, and this is where the uh, Kentucky State Hospital was starting to open up. So we're starting to realize now what it's eventually going to become. Uh, uh, the first the first patients arrived uh, at the hospital in, in April of 1946, uh, and they had a rededication ceremony. 
Now, there's a lot of different names associated with this. So, like we, so we said that uh, Governor Chandler was the one that designed it or instituted this. So his name's involved with it. Uh, if you look, there's a big plaque on the side of the building right right now today that says dedicated uh, by uh, Governor King Johnson. But as we know, it never opened up, so it never ran under his administration. So in 1946, Simon Willis was the governor, and this is the guy who was there uh, doing the uh, ribbon cutting and opening everything up for, for the first time. So additionally, besides uh, the building, the Army also left everything that they bought uh, to run the hospital. So all the talking about beds, medical supplies, all those things were included in this $1 price that the state paid. But they've already proved they couldn't uh, afford to operate it. So the Army gifted all this, this supplies to uh, the state to run. So this was really a good deal for, for Kentucky. Uh, the the uh, dedication ceremony was really a huge, huge deal in the community. Uh, we can see here pictures of the guys that were uh, doing the ribbon cutting. And it wasn't just uh, a political thing. It was also a community, a community thing. And they said that over uh, 4,000 people came from surrounding towns, Danville and Harrisburg and Stanford to the ribbon cutting. Everybody was involved and they cared about this hospital from day one. Uh, everybody wanted to be a, a part of it. So all the politicians came to get their opportunity to grandstand and you know, take credit for, for everything, you know, the way, the way things run. Uh, they were all there. Uh, to show everybody, this is a picture here of that of that uh, of that dedication ceremony. The governor, Governor Simon Willis, was there. Uh, the head of the uh, Department of Welfare was there. Everybody was there to show their support. Uh, that picture is a little bit hard to read, but it is the original program uh, from that dedication ceremony. Wow, which was mind blowing to hold in my hands, by the way. No doubt. Yeah. Um, Look at that. Wow. Is, that's kind of a, of a list of some of the people that had came for. Uh, there's a whole notebook full of, of these names. Uh, people that signed that were there at the dedication ceremony. You can see that they come from all over from Harrisburg and Danville and all of the surround, surrounding towns. Uh, so the original view of the property after every, as the state took, took it over uh, from the army looked like this. This is an area view. Uh, so you can see there's a lot of buildings and all these buildings, uh, as you can see the, uh, where the POW stayed and the hospital itself and all these buildings in the back are staff housing, doctors, nurses, uh, people of that nature lived on, on grounds. And just for comparison, I, I wanted to show an original view and a current day view of the property. So a lot of the, of the personal buildings that was there for doctors and nurses are now no longer there. And nobody lives on ground now, but the warden. Uh, but all the, all the, a lot of the other buildings are still as they were built. And these, a lot of these staff did live on grounds. And this is a this picture here is showing a picture of a young lady who's a nurse that lived on grounds. And her, pretty much this hospital became their lives. Uh, they lived on grounds. They worked long hours, uh, and this this was their their home. Uh, this is originally when the hospital first opened up. Uh, nine nurses and one doctor was hired for 230 patients. Uh, so that's pretty of a uh, concerning number. That's a really, really low, low staff. Uh, interesting part is that when they first started uh, taking in patients, uh, of course, patients who are mentally ill were there, and the military PSD guys were there. Interestingly enough, uh, homosexuality was considered a mental illness at this point in time in the 40s. So they were a lot of times committed there. Uh, alcoholics, uh, teenagers who found themselves pregnant uh, were written off by their families. Uh, unwed mothers were not uh, approved of, nor were they wanted. So a lot of times these young girls would spend their entire lives in a mental facility when nothing was wrong with them except that they had gotten pregnant. Uh, and also the mental, the mental hospital became a dumping ground for the elderly. So we can see there's a lot of people here who are not mentally ill are still in the hospital. And this was just a clear, this was common across the United States and not just yes. uh, Darnall. This was just how we came to treat mental illness. Wouldn't that, oh, would you say, Jack? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You know, in that previous slide, Jack, you mentioned that it was proving hard to find personnel. I'm just mm -hmm. kind of curious, was there any specific reason at that point? 
Well, the reason mainly was because the pay was very low. Okay. Even for even for those, those year standards, and they worked a lot. So they worked like twelve hour shifts, six hours a day, and the pay was very low. Wow. So unless unless you were just desperate, you were not you were not going to sign up to work there. Uh, I will note that that this does change uh, later on in the years, and they have a, a full a full staff. But in those early days, nobody wanted any part of working there. Uh, many of the of the headlines that that come off to the hospital are statewide. Uh, this this hospital is a big deal uh, across the state. Uh, it's in the first years of operation, uh, they're really getting their feet under them. Uh, interesting story about this picture is that the guy who ran, who was the superintendent, his name was J. A. Mendelson. He was a retired uh, Army colonel, and he retired from the Army and took over uh, personal uh, supervision of the Texas State Hospital. His wife also lived on the grounds I was in, and she was very big in the community, uh, had all the social connections, and she had reached out to the public saying that we need donations. Our patients are not being fed. Uh, we can't afford to feed them. And it was a struggle uh, to feed them on what the state gave them, that they were, they were being fed. So she put, but she put the word out on her own, and the uh, Boyle County Farm Bureau says, well, we're not going to have this in our community. So they hollered out for all, of, all the farmers. Everybody donated. You can see the picture. All these different eggs and milk and cheeses and foods of all kinds came in, pouring in, saying, hey, we, we got your back. The problem Absolutely. was... That's amazing. And I'll just add that if it happened today, I believe that the Boyle County, as well as the other surrounding counties, would certainly, hopefully, step yeah. in and do the same. I think that's always been community spirit here on Harrington Lake. Absolutely. The, the problem with this is that uh, the patients were not starving and that nobody asked for food. She was the only one who knew anything about it. So when these trucks rolled up with all this food, uh, the staff was like, oh, what's going on here? Uh, uh, so her husband became shall we say, severely aggravated with her because it put a lot of a lot of bad light on the hospital. It instituted a complete investigation uh, by the state officials because the inmates are starved or the patients are starving. You know, he's like, well, what have, what have you done? You know, the patients are not starving. So from that point forward, uh, she was removed from having anything to do with the operation of the hospital. Uh, and I'm sorry, Jack, hospital. just to clarify again, this was the warden's wife? This is the superintendent's wife. Yeah. Or the superintendent's. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Wow. All right. Wow. Yeah. So she kind of took it upon, upon herself to, you know, to make a call out because they were struggling. I think they were, right. I think they were receiving seven, six cents per inmate a day to feed them with. Wow. And it was a, it was a struggle, but they were, they were doing it. Uh, she thought she was trying to help, but it caused a huge investigation. Almost cost him his job, uh, but it turned out, all, turned out all right. Uh, and then after this happened, uh, Mendelson, the guy, the superintendent there, he took it upon himself to institute the legislature, and he was awarded seven hundred fifty thousand dollars to create a beef and pork and vegetable program. And this was huge because these programs were man were mandated by the patients. So the cows and the pigs in the farm, they were completely labor free, no no money involved, and they were. His goal was for the hospital to be self supporting, nothing from the state given to him. That's exactly what he achieved. So through the beef and the pork and the vegetables, he was able to completely feed the hospital. And also note that he had so much left over that he also supplied all this stuff to Kentucky School for the Deaf there in Danville. And he also sent food to Eastern State Hospital uh, in the Eastern Park. So there's three different facilities there who are eating beef, pork, and vegetables because of this program. So the hospital became completely self-supported and it was not uh, supported by the taxpayers. And I just wanted to show a picture there of the beef, two patients with the beef program that it became hugely successful. And as a, as a side note, I will say that that beef and pork program is still ongoing today, uh, maintained by the inmates there at North Park. All right, so since uh, by 1950, a new era kind of comes in. Uh, the hospital was really on the cutting edge of treatment at this time uh, for, mental, for mental illness. Uh, before this time, there wasn't a whole lot of treatment available. Uh, most of the patients were just chained chained to the bed or, or whatever. There was really no treatment for it. Uh, but in 1950, we started seeing some change. And what's really exciting to me is that the Kentucky State Hospital was on the cutting edge nationwide of this new treatment. 
Uh, however, since a lot of the, the methods that were they used was considered, you know, uh, shocking today, but at that time period, 1950, it was absolutely the cutting edge of treatment. Uh, so, like we have the they started using the lobotomy, uh, hydrotherapy, insulin shock therapy, and electric shock therapy. All those were cutting edge treatments. Uh, the lobotomy is just, if you don't know what, what that is, it's the process of just going through the eye socket with an ice pick and hitting the frontal lobe of the brain and it stopped to change behavior. So, uh, if you could go, if you had a mental issue, they would thought you could go in there and poke that front part of the brain around and it, you'd come out changed. Well, that was absolutely true. You did come out changed. And for the most part, it was negative. So you'd have you have people have the lobotomy and they would go in uh, quiet and shy. They would come out very loud mouth, boisterous, rude, complete change of personality and vice versa uh, because uh, the brain had been changed. Uh, and uh, this, this uh, I also found out through my research that the army had been doing this secretly uh, before the hospital was belonged to a state. They'd also done lobotomies on some of their, their soldiers. But this was now considered a uh, common treatment. Uh, this is cutting edge treatment that everybody should receive with mental illness. Uh, and I just, this, this picture shows the operating room there during that time at the hospital where these lobotomies were performed. And they were really receiving a lot of positive attention nationwide uh, for, this, for this behavior. And this, I think I'll just add, Jack, Jack, if you don't mind, I'll just add very quickly just my own past in um, psychology and counseling. Like I think, I think you probably agree. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't out of this desire to be cruel. They legitimately thought these things worked and there were sort of two, there were two kind of medical thoughts. There was that thought, you know, which included mm -hmm. the the different types of like kinetic and physical therapies, but it was, they just didn't have medications in the way that right. uh, it was right in the same time, the you know, like Thorazine being one of the first mm -hmm. antipsychotics that was developed, like that was game changing for them, but it ended up causing this huge sort of disruption in the field. It was almost like mm -hmm. half of the hospitals were stu still doing these very invasive kinetic treatments, whereas the other ones were just starting on this medication. Uh, so right. that, we, I think we both know that changed everything. But yeah, looking at these pictures, it's just terrifying. Yeah, that, that's a very good point. It was not intended as punishment. Or to be mean to them, they they were actually believing in this procedure. Yeah, they could really really help people. Uh, the picture that's on the screen is the way that the operating that same operating table looks today, uh, as the hospital sits today. That's the current picture. Wow. Uh, this was interesting to me because this is the uh, medicine cabinet in behind uh, the operating table, and it's kind of too small to see. But those are labels of medicine, which is a great point that you just brought attention to is a lot of these uh, medicines they started using, which is Thorazine and, and Lithium, really changed the field of medical treatment. And those those are labels that say Thorazine and Lithium on that door. They were placed there at that time. They're still there today. And it was kind of fascinating to me. Wow. Uh, Jack, Jack may, I, may I ask, when was the last time you were in the facility? I mean, in the, in the Darnall over? Um, 2021, I guess. Wow. I was just curious. I, I mean, I just, it's that whole concept of walking around an abandoned asylum just feels so spooky, but at the same uh, time, just completely fascinating. Definitely spooky. <laughs> yeah. All right. So the hydrotherapy was a big treatment uh, nationwide, and the Kentucky State Hospital was leading the charge on that. They were huge on this. So uh, you can see the, the patient there. The idea of hydrotherapy was to use uh, water as treatment. So if you have somebody who is very lethargic, uh, very slow. Uh, they can put them in an ice cold bath, and that's supposed to perk them up. And the opposite is also true. Somebody was being kind of violent, uh, it was uh, hard to handle. They can put them in a scalding bath, and it was supposed to calm them down. And the, the top went over top of the bathtub, so nothing was sticking out but their head. So they could not escape. So the doctor ordered exactly what temperature the water was supposed to be. The nurse carried it out, and they were in there for whatever however long the doctor said was was in there. Uh, sadly, I've read of some, some cases where this is not, which was also thought to be a cure, per se, for homosexuality. So they put these, these people who are uh, caught in sexual acts, uh, homosexual acts, in this scalding water with the intent that it was going to cure them. So, of course, when you're being essentially scalded alive, 
you're going to say, yes, absolutely. I've learned, I've learned better now. I'm not going to do this anymore. But, you know, obviously it's not going to change anything. But the, the thought at the time period was that if they get enough hydrotherapy, it will change uh, their outlook. Uh, and, and hydrotherapy was hugely uh, one of the things that they, they used a lot. And you can see the controls there in the background that says exactly how much water is used, the exact temperature, and for how long. And those are the, the knobs and controls that uh, the nurse would set. Um, and it wasn't always wasn't always uh, whole bodies. This guy's just receiving his on his arm. I guess he had an injury of, of some sort. Uh, and you can see the the nurse uh, getting ready to uh, apply some medical procedures there to a mental patient. And really big news for the hospital as they started to go on about uh, their treatment is they received their first x-ray machine. So up until this point, these patients had to be taken out and taken to the local hospital for x-rays. Well, now they went to the point where they paid $13,000, which is uh, which would be you know hugely amount more today, but $13,000 in that time period. And they got their own x-ray machine, uh, which was a huge deal uh, to them at, at that time. And this is the x-ray machine as it sits today. Still and it's still there. there. That is amazing. Yeah. And there were, uh, I, I found tons and tons of past x-rays, uh, a lot of which were, seemed to be of male genitalia. Really? I get, to, I get to figure out why. I don't know if it was a sterilization thing, if they, if they were checking for syphilis or what it was, but uh, I, did, I, did, I did find a lot of those. And on that note, I will say that uh, before I, I get off that subject, that syphilis was a huge deal during this time period. And there was no cure for it for many, for many years. And for a long time, they had no idea how it even cost. So that meant much less treat it. Uh, but then uh, they treated syphilis with malaria. So they would give the patient malaria to the cure syphilis. But then you've got malaria. So, I mean... Right, and, and, and both of those diseases on their own also cause mental impairment, right? You know, from right. hallucination or to you know exactly. any number of variety of issues. Exactly right. That's just impressive. That that is that's just wild to see that that old uh, the X-ray machine is still there. That's just yeah, wild. It's, it's still still very much there. Uh, so then we talk about the employee shortage shortage again. Uh, that they really had a hard time getting nurses uh, in here. So. The, the Kentucky State Hospital, being the uh, on the front edge as it was, decided they were not going to be short of nurses. They just started their own nursing school. If they were having problems getting nurses trained, they started their own. So the very first class, they graduated 296 LPNs and nurses aides who were trained on grounds and worked there for their careers. I've been able to research in the book. I was able to talk to a lot of people who, whose mother or some family member who was a nurse here or worked there in some way. Everybody is connected to the hospital in some way, shape, or form. I, I just that. like, and Jack, literally this week, I probably have gotten 12, 13 um, email messages from people or comments that, hey, my mom worked there, or you know, what have you. Uh, may I ask follow up? The first hospital to develop its own nursing school is that, I assume it's not nationally, maybe just the state of Kentucky. I just was curious. Yeah, in Kentucky, yeah. Okay, gotcha. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, so, Day to day life here at the hospital. You can see there are two two patients preparing the meals for their for their floor. It was a very you know mund mundane life. Everything was as you would expect it to be in a in a facility institution type. It's the same things you know day in day out. However, occasionally we had exciting things happen and sad things happen. Patient deaths, patient escapes, and these were not uncommon at all. So there was one uh, particular incident. I can think of right off the top of my head here is about, or a patient was beaten to death and she was a patient. Uh, she, her name was Lucy. Uh, she was a local and she was very quiet, very reserved. Uh, she stayed in her room. Uh, she came out one day to get some fresh air. Another patient who was violent attacked her in the recreation yard and beat her to death. Wow. So this became, this, this became headlines. Uh, so the state superintendent, as you can see there in the headlines, uh, says that his response was a hey, shorter staff. This is not uncommon. These things happen. It was kind of written off and forgotten about. 
uh, and that's really the that's really the the way a lot of the patient deaths were handled. Uh, it was not a big deal like you would think it would be today. It was just kind of like uh, these things happen in this environment, and it's still a lot of the patients I found out in my research uh, died because they jumped in Lake Harrington for a swim. Really, was, you know, it's really you know really we're talking about a matter of footsteps here from the hospital grounds to the lake. Uh, so these guys would have no problem getting out and going to the lake to jump in. And a lot of them never came back. Wow. Uh, some uh, fishermen would find their body floating, you know, days later. And again, it was no no big deal. It was something, you know, mark them off. Uh, this guy's gone. You know, wh whatever. Uh, uh, of course, every, when they did find them, autopsies were performed. This is why the autopsy room in the hospital looks today. Uh, everybody got their aut autopsy, see what they, they died of. Um, and then the storage containers there where they housed the, the deceased bodies. AKA uh, the morgue. Yes, exactly. And that's on the, the first floor. Uh, now that would be spooky. I just, that right there would be spooky. Very spooky room, yes. Um, of course, many, many, many patients over, you know, have passed away, been attacked. Uh, this is a, about an inmate who escaped. Uh, and again, it was like, well, okay, he's gone. Let's check him off. And his body was actually found off on the farm there in Bergen a few days later. Um, and this was not uncommon uh, for them to drown in the lake or to you know, go swimming and just you know, not, not be able to come back. Uh, then we had an active shooter situation Ooh. at the hospital. Uh, this was a patient uh, who was from Bergen. Uh, he had had some mental issues, and he came to the hospital for treatment. He was there for two years, and he was deemed as cured, went home. Well, he got home, and his family quickly found out he was not cured. He was still having some issues, so they brought him back, this time against his will. Well, uh, so they forced him to stay, signed him over to the state. He's yours. Well, he was on board with that. He was also packing a pistol in his, in his gun belt. So he found out he wasn't going home. He pulled his pistol out, and started shooting at wow. nurses, and of course, nurses were uh, diving in every direction, trying to get out of the way of, of the bullets. Uh, and the strange part is, is that the nurses' stations where they're built on each floor, and then there's a half wall that comes out that blocks the view from the nurses' station of the hallway. The elevator is right behind that wall, so anybody getting on and off the elevator cannot be seen by the nurses. Well, this guy came out blazing off the elevator, the nurses couldn't see him at all. So they were they were just kind of am ambushed. And because of that, this is on that on that floor uh, that it happened on, this is what they call the window to nowhere. So this is the window that they installed in that half wall so those nurses could see the elevator. However, there's six other floors you don't have a window. Wow. So the problem problem's still there. Uh, but on that floor they took care of it by installing this window so they couldn't be ambushed again. But there was a hero, there was a male nurse actually, who was a hero of the day uh, because he kindly uh, tackled this gunman. Uh, he took a bullet in the neck for his trouble, but he wow. tackled him. And the sheriff at the time, uh, I, believe it's, I believe it's, I can't remember his last name. Dexter was his last name. And he was the sheriff at the time. He came and arrested this guy and took him to uh, the jail and he eventually went to prison. Even though he had a mental illness, he was still in prison. Jack, did uh, you do run across any numbers like the total, uh, like the number of deaths that maybe have occurred over the lifetime of that facility, or any numbers or any commentary from anybody about that? Well, I actually have a the complete the complete list of uh, admissions and deaths, what they died from. Wow, when, August of it's not in the book because it's so thick. Oh. It, I'm it, sure it, it, it would be a book all on its own. That's fascinating, uh, though. I, I do have those. I do look them up for people on occasion when they holler right at me. Steve, is my is my aunt so and so on this list? And I'll look them up for them and I'll I'll tell them. That's great. Thank you for that. That's a great resource. So anybody listening out there, if they had a, somebody that they knew that was in Darnall, reaching out to you is is okay. Absolutely. All right. Absolutely. Thank you. So one of the main points here I want to I want to make about the hospital is the fact that it was very much a community uh, involvement. A lot of the other mental hospitals were closed door, so you, you you're in, 
and if you're out and you get, couldn't get in, the, that's, the Kentucky State Hospital was completely different. They had an open door policy. So anybody that wanted to come on grounds, come in the hospital, take a patient home with them, whatever, completely welcome. So because of that, the community was very much involved in this in this hospital. And that's why it became so popular with so many people. It was a part of their lives. And the picture that I'm showing here is a community dance that's going on. People come in and they dance with the patients and they talk and they mingle and uh, they just kind of, you know, become, become one. It's not a situation where, you know, they're closed off and like they're in prison. It's a very open door policy. Now, that's wild. In, and several people I, you know, I interviewed for the book talked about that they kept a patient at their home, uh, you know, for a certain amount of time. Or, uh, really? Wow. Uh, my mom and my, my, te- my mom always tells the story that when her and my dad were on their first date in the early 50s, that he took her to the, to the Darnell Hospital. Uh, to look around because it was it was just a what you did at that time it was a huge deal wow you know? so she's he's like well, have you seen the, the new hospital and she's like nope let's go look at it and they drove out there and they got out they went in and they walked around and they met some patients and talked and, and they left that's that was, amazing that's <laughs> amazing what they asked what time what time or what what year would that have been i just know that at some point they probably would have shut that off but i was just kind of curious yeah. when you say early days which which part well that, that was like the uh in the 1950s area wow that's radical so the pioneer playhouse which everybody knows is a huge deal in Danville, uh, was also very active here at the hospital uh says they put on uh they're very active in involving the community in the hospital and they got they put on their first show there at the hospital in 1950 uh, the, the, you can see the play there. It's called the Bluff Spirit. They put on, and this was such a huge deal that the hospital actually built a whole new building just for those plays. Uh, because the, the community would come in, they would watch the play. Uh, the inmates would be, or I keep calling them inmates. The patients would be sitting right beside somebody from the community, and they would share in the play together. It was again, it's a very much a community event. Uh, and it was it was referred to as the uh, Texas State Hospital Theater. And it was a big deal, and that's, this is the original the original program, you know, from uh, the play. They had their own stage they had set up for the plays. This now is the staff canteen for the prison, by the way. Uh, but at the time, it was their theater room. I see a little Christmas tree on the side there. There must have been a Christmas performance. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. So it says by 1951, there's over 125 different groups that came in from the outside. These were all uh, religious, religious based supplies. People would regularly donate books and magazines and clothes or whatever anybody wanted because, again, the community was involved in this. Uh, the hospital here had its own basketball team. So you can see some of the, the patients there. Jack, may I uh, uh, just interrupt qu- quickly? And I was this community involvement, do you, I'm assuming you probably have seen or done some research on just state hospitals as a whole. It just seems to me this is so unique to have the community so integrated into, mm-hmm. but maybe I'm wrong. I, I guess I'm just not sure if this was something that was, that you think is perhaps unique to, to Durnall or whether that was something yeah. that was, I, I just have very, a hard time putting my fingers around the fact that that would have been something so common. Yeah, it's very unique. It was they were they were pretty much one of a kind. Wow, uh, thank you. Had, all of the other mental facilities facilities in Kentucky were very much closed door, uh, and this this was wide open for the for the community. Fascinating. And uh, of course, you can see some of the mental patients sitting there, and uh, and this this is the community room where people come and visit and talk with the patients and that type of thing. Uh, you can see some guys there, some of the patients playing checkers there. And those uh, women from the outside church uh, came in to visit with them. And that was pretty common day, day to day. Uh, so the patients uh, were all, always given something to show appreciation. This is a huge picnic that they had uh, every year. Uh, the, the, the official uh, guest list uh, that's, that I still was able to get a hold of uh, shows that it had over, started over 600 uh, chickens and so many hundred pounds of potato salad. It was just a huge <laughs> deal. And, and again, this is for the patients and the community. That's a lot so of tater salad for the community. It's, that's it's good. A that's, lot. that's amazing. A lot. 
was Jack, sorry, Jack, just to get, do you think that that, I was just kind of curious, what do you attribute that uniqueness of this? I, I, was it, was it the individuals that were running it? I guess I'm asking, you know, is it like the, the chief medical officer? Like, was that just, you know, what he thought was good therapy? I guess my other thought was maybe it's because there was a, you know, a heavy portion of recovering veterans. I just kind of curious, maybe your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think it was very much from from the get go. It was it was community based from the get go, and they continued that because it was a good form of, of treatment. Yeah, and instead of them being you know closed off, right? Uh, they were very much allowed to see what real world and real people were doing, and that was considered to be part of their treatment. Yes. Thank you. That's it. Is just so unique. That's fascinating. Thank you. So for uh, at the at the end uh, at the end of days. Uh, was the, the hospital closed in 1977, and it really was on the cutting edge the entire time that it was open. And in the 1970s, um, the state came and said that the hospital building needed to be upgraded to the, uh, this is the building that was built in 1937. So now we're in the 70s. So some of the stuff that they built no longer flew. So okay, you're gonna to have to upgrade this, you're going to upgrade that, you're gonna have this kind of paint on the wall, this kind of insulation. And really it was just too expensive and they decided they were gonna close it. Although the people who work there uh, got wind of this and they asked the legislatures, are, are our jobs in jeopardy? And they were really told, absolutely not. Everything is fine at the hospital. A matter of months later, it was empty. Wow. Uh, so, so it happened really, really quickly. And uh, of course, the picture that I'm showing is that it was then uh, turned into the Danville Youth Development Center for juvenile offenders. Uh, it was uh, only, the, only there for a very short time. Uh, budget cuts closed it as well. Uh, and of course, that's when uh, North Point uh, Prison came along and uh, scooped it up. And that is an entirely exciting story, all of its own. Indeed. I have, Indeed. I have a, 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 another book that's all about North Point and how it got to be, because it is an entirely different, different story. Well, we'll have to invite you back for for that one. I mean, that's sure. I mean, that's this has just been really crazy. I, I, Jack, how long was the Youth Development Center there? Or did it turn into the Youth Development Center really quickly after it closed? Or did it? I think it was almost immediately. Wow. A month, a month, and it only lasted, I think, a year or so. Wow. And it was it was done, done away with. Yeah. Was it just like financial issues? Ultimately, yeah, it, the it, need to kind of redo, like, you know, bring it back up to spec? Yeah, it was it was, it was was budget cuts. Yeah. Uh, gotcha. Gotcha. Well, this has been truly amazing. These like the, all the photos and everything, Jack, has just been really fascinating. I guess out of all this, I'd love to ask you what what what's maybe the one single thing that kind of jumps out at you about the whole Darnell Darnall experience. Uh, to me, when I walk into that building, uh, it screams stories that need to be told. Wow! So I am honored honored to be the guy that tells those stories. You know, so I'm. I just want to be able to, uh, that hospital is such an honorable and huge, huge place, you know, that in the community, everybody's touched by it. And to me, I think the thing that just stands out more than anything is just the people that were there. Everybody's lives were invested. Patients, workers, everybody was invested in this. Yeah. And, you know, and for me, like that, to me, from like a historical point of view, in terms of psychiatric treatment, that's what I find the most fascinating is, um, Absolutely. There were just those two two schools of thought, you know, that sort of, I mean, almost torturous school of thought of all the those horrible things that they did to people versus this right. new new wave of medications and therapies. And those two things just were seemed to be always constantly at heads uh, across the nation, at least for us in psychiatric care. It's just fascinating to hear that that one in particular, the one right here on the lake was so open was, uh, i just was. don't hear that story very often it was indeed yes that is amazing well jack this has been incredibly amazing i really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today and i'm excited to get this out to more people um I, like i said tons of people kind of dropped me independent notes saying they were you know like i said their their mom worked there i believe that there was also one of my uh followers i believe she said she she did her nursing practical there or her clinical for nursing was there um so it definitely touched a lot of people's lives and i really appreciate you shedding some light on the local the local aspect of this it's just fascinating absolutely my pleasure
Well, sir, thank you so kindly. I will follow up with you soon just to say thanks and see if there's anything else I could do for you. Like I mentioned, I'm going to get this uh, edited correctly and up on YouTube to share with an audience. And um, I will certainly, I'll, I'll send you the link and make sure you're all on board with that. And I'll certainly include links to your book. Um, I know everybody's listening right now. You can look it up on Amazon, if I remember correctly. And it's uh, mm -hmm. Darnell colon... State Hospital of Kentucky. I, I'm not sure. What was the title there, Sir Jack? It's, uh, it's Darnell, the story of a Kentucky mental asylum. Thank you. Sorry. I knew I, knew I was going to jump over those words. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can certainly get that on Amazon. I'll be providing a link in the uh, commentary or bio below that you see this on. So Mr. Godby, thank you so much. And we will definitely have to have you back for to talk about North Point. I'd be glad to. Thank you very All much. Right. Thank you, sir. Take care. All right.